Joining us now is Maryland Democratic Congressman Jamie Raskin. He served as the lead manager during Trump's second impeachment, which was related to January 6th. He was also a member of the January 6th investigation in Congress. That investigation is how we, the public, came to learn the basics of this story, um, where we first heard from so many of the witnesses to this scheme, discovered so many of the incidents that we now know form the basis uh, for today's indictment. Congressman Raskin, um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's a really important day in U.S. history. Thank you for having me, Rachel. If you were ever doubting the effectiveness of what you and your colleagues did as part of the January 6th investigation in Congress, um, I think it seems clear you can put that to rest tonight, um, having seen this indictment. At least all of us sitting here tonight at MSNBC headquarters reading the indictment today, we feel like this is very much not an outgrowth, but a reflection of the work that you did and the evidence that you turned up. How does it seem from your perspective? Well, that's right. I, I think that the indictment closely tracks a lot of what's in our report. One of the uh, passages that jumped out at me is somewhat new is the one that Ari was citing where Trump said, uh, you know, this is what happens when you steal an election. Actually, this indictment is what happens when you uh, try to steal an election. Um, what we saw happen on January 6th is what happens when Donald Trump loses an election. That's when you get riot and violence and insurrection and attempt to steal an election. But the proper response is precisely what we saw happen today. So I view this as a tremendous vindication of the rule of law in American democracy. And uh, I am especially impressed by uh, Jack Smith and the prosecutors bringing forth the charge about conspiracy to deprive Americans of their rights, uh, specifically the right to vote. And this resonated so much uh, with me because, you know, I love that passage where Abraham Lincoln says that insurrection is a fundamental assault on the first right of democratic government, which is the right of the people to choose their own leaders. Mm -hmm. And what really was January 6 about and everything that led up to it, it was an attempt to usurp from the people our right to choose our own leaders, our own president through the electoral college system such as it is. You, sir, in addition to being a member of Congress and being part of these key investigations and the impeachment process, um, are also a constitutional law professor, um, which we're reminded of on nights like this for all the right reasons. I have to ask, just from that perspective, what do you make of the decision to charge this the way the prosecutors did? How serious um, are these charges, aside from the, the, the resonance and the patriotic import of that one particular charge you just referenced, how serious are these charges? How serious are the penalties associated with these charges? And did they leave anything on the table in terms of things that you think they could have charged, given the evidence as they laid it out, uh, but they may not have put out there? Well, they're very grave and serious charges, of course, but um, extremely well anchored in the facts of the case. Um, we, we know that our friends across the aisle are trying to mobilize some big free speech defense of Donald Trump here, which is just uh, comical because, of course, you have a right to say, for example, oh, I think that the uh, meeting of the House and the Senate in joint session to count electoral college votes is a fraud or is taking away um, uh, you know, Donald Trump's presidency. You can say whatever you want, but the minute you actually try to obstruct the meeting of Congress, you've crossed over from speech to conduct. It's like, you know, you can say, well, I think the currency is phony and everybody should be allowed to make up their own money. You can say that. But the minute you start printing your own money, now you've run afoul of the counterfeit laws. And it's the exact same thing with the Electoral College. They can say, well, we don't think that Joe Biden really won in these states, even though every federal and state court rejected all of their claims of electoral fraud and corruption. But the minute they start manufacturing counterfeit electors and trying to have them substitute for the real electors that came through the federal and state legal process, at that point, they've crossed over from speech to conduct. And so I think that the indictment is really tight in terms of focusing just on the conduct. And in fact, they left out one charge that the January 6th committee uh, had put in there, which was about aiding and abetting and giving aid and comfort to insurrectionists. And uh, I suppose they did that because it's a statute that has not been uh, prosecuted much before. Donald Trump, you know, everything in his world is a case of first impression, pretty much. But um, they tried to stay away from that because I think they didn't want that debate about 
freedom of speech, even though I think it's clear that Donald Trump did, did give aid and comfort to the insurrectionists, calling them great patriots and telling them never to forget this day and egging them on in the middle of the insurrection, saying that Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what needed to be done. But in any event, they've stuck with actual conduct, the actus reus, and they have overwhelming documentation of his intent, of his guilty mind, his mens rea, because, uh, you know, he repeatedly said, and those around him repeatedly said, of course he lost the election and there was nothing to these claims, which his own attorney general, a complete sycophant for the rest of the administration, William Barr, called BS. Congressman, it's Alex Wagner. I wonder if you have thoughts on Mark Meadows. He's been, um, there's been a lot of con uh, suggestions. There's been a lot of assessments about whether he might be a cooperating witness in all this. He is mentioned in the indictment. I know he played sort of footsie, for lack of a better term, with the January 6th committee in terms of handing over some material, but not all. Um, he is mentioned specifically on page 14 of this indictment, and it quotes a conversation that is had between Donald Trump and Mark Meadows about how state election officials in Georgia were conducting themselves, and this is in quotes, conducting themselves in an exemplary fashion. This isn't an email. This isn't a text message. This is a conversation. Does that suggest to you that Mark Meadows is cooperating with this investigation, especially because he is not a named co-conspirator in this? Yeah, I mean, it's hard for me to venture a real guess as to what role he's playing, precisely because uh, there are so many faces to Mark Meadows. And what we learned over the course of the investigation was that he tended to agree with and validate anybody he happened to be speaking to, especially Donald Trump, but also people who were questioning Donald Trump. So uh, I think that's a, a big question mark where he ends up over the course of the investigation and prosecution. Do, uh, well, to that end, I guess I wonder whether you, um, Rachel has made, I think, the point very aptly that a lot of the co-conspirators in this that we can, the, that we have identified thus far are lawyers. And um, as someone who's an expert in constitutional law, I wonder if you could elaborate on the degree to which it is a breach of legal ethics to do what they did. John Eastman has in, reportedly in last, uh, the last week suggested that he was just doing creative lawyering and giving this advice to the president. I wonder how you think that stands up in a court of law. Well, if this is not a violation of professional legal ethics, to participate in an attempt to overthrow a presidential election, which was won by more than 7 million votes, um, uh, 306 to 232 in the Electoral College, um, then there is, really is no such thing as professional legal ethics. But it's similar to what we experienced um, a week or two ago in the Oversight Committee when Marjorie Taylor Greene projected um, pornographic photography um, in our hearing, I mean, of course, if that had been in a book, she would have wanted to ban it, but she put it in our committee. And I said to the chairman, um, if this doesn't violate the rules of congressional decorum, then there are no rules of congressional decorum. But I think we're getting to that place where the Republicans are actually, in an epistemological sense, questioning whether there's a difference between truth and falsehood. And a lot of them will just say, well, who is the government to tell us what's true and what's not true? And of course, the whole judicial system is based on the idea that you've got to prove facts beyond a reasonable doubt and the finder of fact, the jury can sort it out. And, you know, there are these burdens of proof and the courts will determine what actually happened and what's a lie. But now um, the people who claim somehow to speak for ethical absolutism, at least, um, you know, when it comes to matters of theology, or morality when it comes to law, throw up their hands and say, well, there's no way of knowing whether or not, not that violates the rules of ethics or whether or not Joe Biden really won the election. And so this will be a vindication of the Constitution, democracy, and I think also a fact-based government. To that point, Congressman, this is about protecting, defending, holding up democracy. On what ground are your Republican colleagues in the House even beginning to make this comparison that they are today with Hunter Biden? Um, you know, it's difficult almost to torture out some explanation for it. It's obviously a, a frantic and desperate effort to uh, distract everybody from 
um, this unprecedented and phenomenal crime against American democracy. Hunter Biden uh, was not and has not been an elected public official. He was not, uh, has not been a member of the Biden administration or a government uh, official. Um, he apparently committed some crimes and Donald Trump's own appointed U.S. attorney for Delaware, David Weiss, has been prosecuting those crimes, and we're going to allow the justice system to work it out. But you just can't equate these two things. I mean, you're talking about an encyclopedia of outrages and scandals against constitutional government versus what's, you know, at best a comma or a footnote in the annals of American political history, because you're talking about the son of a president. But of course, they haven't laid a glove on Joe Biden, and they have not been able to link him in any way to any of their alleged uh, corruption scandals. And in fact, Rudy Giuliani's right-hand man, Lev Parnas, who gallivanted all over the world with Giuliani looking to cook up some uh, corruption scandal with Joe Biden, wrote a letter to Chairman Comer and to me saying, there's nothing there. There's no evidence of a crime. We tried to find it. There's no evidence of corruption. And he literally called on Chairman Comer to call off the wild goose chase against uh, President Biden. Congressman Jamie Raskin um, of Maryland, again, a really big day. And we really appreciate you making time to spend some of it with us tonight. Thank you so much, sir. You bet.